Welcome everyone. We're just gonna wait for a few more people to arrive, um, but we'll get started momentarily. I guess I can get started with the housekeeping stuff and people can keep making their way in while I do that. So hello everyone um, and welcome to the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Thank you for coming to this panel on global vaccine justice. My name is Kieran Gay and I will be moderating this panel. I have just a few announcements um, and then we will get started with our panelists. Firstly, a tech warning. Um, don't worry if you can't see yourself. This is a Zoom webinar. So all the attendees are automatically muted with videos off. So you will only be able to see the panelists. Um, also throughout the panel, if you have a question, feel free to use the Q&A function. Um, our panelists will complete the presentation and then there will be a brief Q&A session at the end um, where they can answer all of your inquiries. So feel free to submit those as we go. Um, let's see. Um, also um, in the Q&A, while the panelists are speaking, we'll be sending out a link that um, contains instructions on how to do the following things. Um, firstly, um, for the legal professionals in the audience, how to get um, CLE, credit for your attendance. And secondly, how to donate to the alumni board, um, Friends of Land, Air, Water, which provides stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships. Um, lastly, the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, Community of Oregon, and the Confederated Tribes of Silex, Indians of Oregon, and continue to make important con uh, contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Polk would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya peoples in the Willamette Valley and express our respect for the indigenous peoples of Oregon and our respect for their sovereignty. Um, we will now introduce our panelists. So we have today Brooke Baker, who is a law professor at Northeastern Law and an honorary research fellow at the University of KwaZulu Natal in Durban, South Africa. Um, recently, he has been working on accelerating research on an equitable global access to vaccines, medicines, and diagnostics to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. He has written and consulted extensively on intellectual property rights, trade, investor state dispute settlement, um, access to medicines and medicines um, regulatory policy. Additionally, he has served as a key board member for the NGO delegation of um, Unitaid, which um, acts to improve market dynamics and early market entry of medicines and diagnostics needed to address HIV, AIDS, TB, Hep C, and malaria. He presently is a civil society representative to the therapeutics pillar of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator. Also with us today, we have Zane Rizvi, um, who is an expert on pharmaceutical innovation and access to medicines. He has provided technical assistance to state and national governments, coordinated civil society coalitions, and published on intellectual property, access to medicines, and global health. He was a Gruber Fellow at Section 27, a Johannesburg-based public interest organization. Zane obtained a JD from Yale Law School, where he was a student director of the Yale Global Health Justice Partnership. He has a bachelor's degree from McMaster University and is published in medical and legal journals, um, including The Lancet and Yale Journal of Law and Technology. I will now turn things over to our panelists. Thank you. So I, I think I'm going to start, and I guess since we're talking about vaccines, I, I certainly want to start with uh, hope that everyone who's attending uh, this webinar is are themselves vaccinated, uh, and and that uh, your loved ones and friends and and neighbors are as well. Uh, so I'm I'm going to uh, discuss some introductory material, and then, and Zane is going to give a much more detailed presentation on the desirability of manufacturing, particularly messenger RNA uh, vaccines and, and some other related issues as well. But we've kind of split this up between us. Uh, we think we're gonna go about 20 minutes a piece uh, 
and 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 hope that's that uh, works for folks. So I'm going to put my screen up first. Um, but it says the host is disabled participant screen sharing. So I need the host to undo that if possible so that I could screen share. You should be good to go. Okay. Perfect. And um, I hope I can get this to, to present. I always find it a little hard to do that in the slideshow, but let's see. Um, okay. So this should convert to play from the start and, and we can we can go forward. So um, this is a map that that basically shows um, the uh, current overview of the number of people who are uh, have received vaccines. It's um, doses per 100 people. And as you can see, with the green colors in particular, some countries uh, have received many times more than just one dose per person, uh, two, and in some instances, even more than two. And those are countries that have, have wide coverage of population and uh, ac generally access to uh, booster shots as well. And you will see countries that are in a different color, uh, lower shades of green and, and yellow. And the pr principally when you look at Africa, you see that there are what we would call uh, vaccine deserts, basically very low levels of coverage. And, and those levels, low levels of coverage are in low income and lower middle income countries in particular, but a, quite a significant percentage of those countries are actually located uh, in, in um, in Africa itself. So this is another representation of the same information. It shows vaccinations by income group uh, as of the end of February, just a, a few days ago. And you can see uh, how much higher uh, vaccination coverage is in high income and upper middle income countries compared to lower middle income and low income countries. Um, and you know these are dramatic disparities there's a little bit of uh, catch up over time, but one of the interesting things about this, this map is it shows how gradual the increase has been uh, in particularly low income countries and how rapid the increase was, particularly in, in high com income countries from the very start and you know how it's still uh, continued to accelerate up. So uh, I, I'm going to talk about, you know, very briefly about, you know, the disadvantages of the current intellectual property regime um, that governs both uh, and rules both the um, system for uh, innovation of health technologies and the uh, system for access to technologies. And I think it's important for us to pay attention to both of those. So um, on the one side, we, we, we have what we might call open access. This would be uh, open science at the very beginning to encourage more collaboration, more sharing of data, uh, fewer research silos, so that scientists could progress together shoulder to shoulder instead of competing to some extent against each other, particularly within siloed corporate structures. Um, if we had open, uh, open access and open uh, research perspectives, we'd probably also do clinical trials differently. They wouldn't be controlled by the companies themselves. They might be funded by government. Uh, there would be many more comparative studies to find out which products were actually more effective for it, their intended purpose. Um, we, would, we would have more accurate and honest um, construction of, of the clinical trials themselves and better and more accurate reporting of the outcomes. Uh, we could research treatment regimens instead of each product uh, one by one and, and really have as a result a better choice of products and, and better what, call, what might be called regulatory co coherence. Uh, we would then with result to these new innovations and in, uh, that were tested and, and approved safe and efficacious and we knew which ones were the best for which population, we could have uh, you know, what's essentially called open licensing. We would, we would essentially say, okay, anyone who's capable of producing this is entitled to produce it. And we have close to what we would call generic production where sales would be at, at or near the cost of production with a slight profit. 
And uh, because of competition and increased sources of supply, we would have something close to ideal supply and lowest price and therefore much more possibility of equitable access. Um, and as part of that open licensing, particularly as we've discovered is needed in the, in the uh, COVID context for vaccines, we might need deep term technology transfer, not just to patent rights, which would, but also some other underlying information uh, that, that Zane will also be talking about. Uh, I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with intellectual property rules, um, and, but, and I'm gonna not do a long lecture on them. I'm gonna try to present the key information very quickly, but this is under what we call exclusivities. And, and intellectual property rights are basically rights that allow the right holder to exclude someone else from, exercise, you know, from working a patent or having access to trade secrets or making a copy of something that's copyrighted. So those are, those are called exclusivities. We, we might also call them the, the basis for monopoly rights because they prevent competition. And so we have patents, which can be on the products themselves, the processes by which uh, a, a product is made, the particular uses of a product in the medicine contact for a particular disease or condition, uh, and in some cases, even the underlying platforms that are used to build te te other technologies or broader, uh, broader technologies. In addition, we have what are uh, known for mo to most of us, the most common term we might know about is trade secrets. Um, in, in many regimes, it's called confidential um, you know, commercial information, um, but it includes in the biopharmaceutical context, manufacturing know-how, formula, quality control systems, uh, sometimes the biological resources and formulas that are actually used. And, and basically companies have a right to keep this secret um, from, from all comers uh, if they designate it as a trade secret. Patents are on the other hand are typically of, of 20 year duration though the patents can be, can be what's called evergreen because of successive patents you file on different aspects of a product and its production. There are as well um, in uh, biomedical products, particularly um, in, in devices and in some diagnostics, um, there are uh, uh, copyright uh, issues uh, and personal protective equipment, some industrial design issues, there are general data right issues that with respect to regulatory approval of, of, of generic equivalents that might prevent uh, that such approval. Um, and then, you know, at the bottom of this, this pile that I've got here is a biological black box. That is the actual biological materials to make some vaccines and most biological medicines, biologic medicines, you know, actually require cell lines that is also secretly held and retained by the companies themselves. And all these things reduce uh, uh, competition, artificially restrict supply, can result in needlessly high prices and ultimately inequitable distribution. So uh, focusing on scientific preparedness, pandemic preparedness, which we know is important, we would have been way better off if, if something different had been done in the past. Uh, we know that uh, if, if we took pandemic preparedness uh, it's seriously to heart and if companies had done so, and even if the NIH and, and some of the other funders of research had done so, we would have had more focused basic science research in the past instead of uh, some largely troughs, even uh, for coronavirus, which, which we've experienced twice in the last um, 20 years before, before uh, uh, this particular coronavirus pandemic. Um, and, and we would have been better prepared to come up with the products that are needed. Uh, the research would, would focus on the pandemic risks and, and beginning to develop the products that need to attack uh, the coronavirus in, in multiple ways. We would, have, we would have been more advanced in that. We would have had more uh, uh, focused and, and greater resources from government funding. Uh, and we would have, you know, as well, you know, made sure that the products and approaches that we were focusing on would address what we might call neglected populations, um, you know, uh, that, that might have special, um, because of where they live and resource limitations might need products that are better adapted for use in those, those uh, places. 
In the other column, we have what happens under the monopoly commercial system that we cur currently have, uh, where the companies don't have historically have not focused on vaccines until the very recent past. Now they've, they've gotten out of the business in the same way they've gotten out of antibiotics in the same ways they've never really researched neglected diseases. Instead, they focus on blockbuster drugs that make a ton of money for chronic diseases that rich people have, and also what are called now niche buster products, which are, you know, uh, for a smaller number of people, often cancer, uh, but other, other conditions as well, where they can make a, make a lot of money because they charge $100,000 or more per, uh, per year for a course of treatment. Um, Again, as focus has been on chronic diseases, um, on what are called orphan diseases, but the ones that have high potential for, for high price sales, and always with a focus mainly on, on affluent populations. And just as a evidence of this, uh, nearly 70% of global pharmaceutical profits um, by big pharma companies are earned by sales in the US because we pay the highest prices um, you know, uh, of, of any country in the world. So, um, you know, on, on just to uh, drill down a little bit on the research for, for coronavirus uh, and coronavirus vaccines, uh, NIH vaccine funding uh, totaled nearly $17 billion from 2000 to 2019. And this is on all vaccine platforms. So this wasn't coronavirus specific, but you can see here in red, the spending that had occurred on coronavirus as a specific uh, specific uh, research target. Um, and, you know, it went up and down and it went up when there was a scare with MERS or SARS, the first SARS, uh, and then, you know, down uh, shortly thereafter. Um, the coronavirus specific research was, was you know, shy of a billion dollars. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just to say that once uh, the pandemic hit, there is huge investment um, via something called uh, Operation Warp Speed. And these are just uh, huge sums of money that received by various countries. And I know Zane is gonna uh, hone in particular on, um, on the money received by Moderna. Um, but there was $19.24 billion to vaccine developers, another uh, $2.5 billion to contract manufacturers and suppliers who supplied some of the things those manufacturers need and just huge investment by the federal government uh, in, in vaccine development. Also additional spending <coughs> for therapeutics and, and diagnostics, but to a lesser extent. So product development, uh, I've already talked about the benefit of open science, transparency, collaboration, sharing, uh, versus proprietary product development, which is secrecy, research silos, uh, and continued focus on commercial potential, which means high profit uh, potential. Um, I want to turn now to you know what we typically think about as the problems with the grow out of monopolies, which is uh, on the one hand you could have a model that had open license and deep technology transfer, which would result in a quicker delivery of adequate supplies and lower prices. Um, you could also through this encourage manufacturing in multiple regions of the world, uh, including low and middle income countries. And you could ensure that the, uh, the existing capacity of qualified manufacturers would be used so that you could speed up the response to the pandemic. Against that, you have what we uh, experienced in the pandemic with respect to, to vaccines. There was artificial vaccine scarcity because the companies uh, did not uh, uh, resort to all capacity that, that existed in the world. They wanted to keep it proprietary. Uh, there's pandemic profiteering in terms of pricing. Prices many, many times the cost of production. Uh, and you know the Moderna and Pfizer are, are standing to make, and now already have made billions and billions of dollars in sales. Um, and then because of um, certain conditions, which I'll discuss in just a minute, has really been delayed in inequitable delivery as we saw in a previous slide uh, to low and middle income countries, basically what we've come to call vaccine apartheid. So artificially uh, restricted supply, uh, there was a focus on supplying rich countries. Um, there was a desire to tightly to control the manufacturing process. So companies focused on expanding only their own internal capacity uh, and also entered into contract manufacturing agreements with, with a relatively small number of companies that they knew they could, could tightly control. 
Um, they, the companies, uh, despite this limited capacity, have made promises about increasing supply uh, and never really been able to, to, to actually do it because of manufacturing difficulties. Um, and so they, in a sense, continued to misrepresent the supply they have. Uh, and then the, the worst, worst uh, outcome of artificially restricted supply is that, produce, that provokes the kind of hoarding that took place by the US, Europe, and other rich countries to gobble up initial supplies and stockpile them and have them sitting in warehouses um, so that they would sure to be able to vaccinate their populations. Um, prices vary from three to $37 a dose. Um, Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca uh, promise a cost plus basis and there's, they are the cheaper medicines. The off, others offer no cost transparency and, and charge as much as $37 a dose. Uh, which for a double dose means almost $75 for, for vaccination. A vaccination sales in just in 2021, Moderna $17.7 billion, Pfizer $36.7 billion. These are just huge amounts of money with, with huge profit. Moderna has announced that out of that $17.7 billion of sale, 12 billion of it was, was pure profit. Uh, they just announced in their 2021 um, financial results. Um, Pfizer has signaled that when the pandemic ends, which means the endemic stage, which we're already talking about in the US, that they might uh, raise the prices even further. The distribution problem, um, you know, uh, a sensible world would have said um, to, to address this pandemic, we need to stop it everywhere as quickly as we can and we would equitably distribute vaccines. Um, we would have sufficient donor and domestic funding and for poor countries, we, we would rely more on donor funding to make sure that everyone can be vaccinated. We'd strengthen health systems, we'd set up procurement and supply chains, we'd, we'd train and, uh, uh, and capacitate more health workers, and we would have a quicker end of the pandemic. Um, but with <coughs> country nationalism uh, and, and commercial control over uh, who, gets, uh, who gets the supplies, We've had preferential and disproportionate supply to rich countries. Uh, low and middle income countries have been left behind. Um, there's been a delayed response and by many estimates, uh, at least twice as many people have died. And those are old estimates. So I, I think the, the figures have probably changed now quite significantly. Um, we, I, 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 I would be remiss if I don't call out the fact that there's been what we call vaccine nationalism, an idea that you can and should take care of the people in your own country first and foremost, and to sometimes even only, uh, and, and somehow that that protects them. And we know that that's just ridiculous uh, with the global uh, virus that is respiratory. Um, borders just don't matter. Uh, and when you have unvaccinated poor, uh, populations, that's who get infected. That's where new variants develop. The, the virus mutates, and especially mut mutates in people who are immune compromised, including those are people with HIV. And then those variants come back to haunt us. So that's why we've had Delta. That's why we've had uh, Omicron. That's why we have Omicron too. And who knows what's coming down the, the pike. Um, and each successive cycle of vaccine nationalism where countries think we can take care of and should take care of our country first, even if that means others remain unvaccinated and at risk and where variants will, will percolate, um, that's just a, a very stupid strategy by our uh, government leaders. So uh, there are a couple of promising developments I'm gonna talk about very briefly. One is um, there was a proposal by South Africa and India to push for a temporary waiver of intellectual property protections on COVID health technologies during the, the, during the pandemic. Um, and uh, well over hundred countries have voiced their support for this. There are over 60 formal supporters and, and another 40, 50 uh, or so who are, you know, give statements in support of the waiver. Um, and despite that, here we are 17 months later uh, and we don't have the waiver achieved yet. The US has stated its support for the waiver, at least for vaccines back in May of 2021. But despite that statement of support, the U.S. has done nothing really concretely to try to finalize a textual agreement. In fact, has largely sided with the European Union 
um, which has, you know, to this point in time, refused to um, talk seriously about the waiver that's proposed. This waiver would allow countries to act in their own self-interest to override patent rights and data, uh, data rights and trade secrets so that their manufacturers could make the products that they don't have. And it's, it's pretty outrageous that the countries that were first in line and that had first in line access to vaccine, first in line access to therapeutics, first in line access to tests, now stand in the way of countries that are trying to get increased access for their own populations. And finally, I wanna talk very briefly about the WHO messenger RNA technology transfer hub. This is an effort to establish in South Africa a new facility that is developing its own messenger RNA uh, vaccine technology that it will then transfer to multiple other country manufacturers. And so far, um, the, the hub has, uh, has managed within a relatively short period of time to, uh, to reverse engineer the Moderna vaccine. Um, and has entered an agreement with 13 other countries that, that they will be supplied, um, I'm, excuse me, that they will be able to set up their, their own companies. Uh, and this is really a new model where countries realizing that they can't depend on the charity model and they can't depend on a monopoly system that doesn't get them the products they need and that they should become more self-reliant. And, and this is a very promising development that basically says, we're not going to let you stop us. If need be, we'll, we'll make it from scratch ourselves. Um, and it's, it's gratifying that there's some support for that and, and, and quite surprising that they've made as much progress as they have. Though there's still some risk of Moderna asserting some of its intellectual property rights. And I, I think that's one of the things that Zane might be talking about in his uh, presentation as well. So I think that's the end of my presentation. So I will stop sharing and turn it over to Zane. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Brooke. Um, so I will also need to share my screen. Um, okay. Um, so my name is Zane Rizvi. I'm a research director at Public Citizen, Public Citizen's Consumer Advocacy Group in Washington, DC. I'm in the Access Medicines team. Um, and we have been looking into COVID-19 uh, access issues, I would say, you know, really since the start of the pandemic, because much of this was foreseeable. Um, so I'll start by just um, providing some context of where we're at. Um, this is a graph of deaths in the world uh, by region all around the world, and of course, you know, limitations about uh, reporting, about, you know, how accurate, how accurate the data is, underreporting, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's still a stark reminder of where we're at. Um, the first vaccine uh, in the U.S. was authorized December 11th. That was the Pfizer vaccine. And at that point, December 11th was very, very early on, right? We're talking about there had been about 1.6, 1.7 million reported deaths at that point. Uh, since then, you will see there have been millions and millions and millions and millions of more deaths. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. One, of course, is the Delta variant that came that was particularly devastating. Um, one is uh, vaccine hesitancy and the unwillingness of some people to get vaccinated. Um, and then finally, one of them, of course, is uh, the vaccine uh, gaps that we have seen, the vaccine apartheid. Uh, is the word that the South African government has used um, to describe this. Uh, huge swaths of the world did not have access to vaccines, do not really have uh, sufficient access to vaccines, particularly the best kinds of vaccines. And as you can see, you know, at least if you go based on reported deaths, more people have died uh, you know, after the vaccines have been introduced because of a lack of access um, than have died uh, prior to the introduction of vaccines. So I'll focus on, I guess, as a case study, one particular vaccine, which is the NIH Moderna vaccine, uh, which is of course, one of the more popular vaccines uh, in the world and also in the, in the US, uh, right along with the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Um, and so it'll be, I'll, I'll go through some of the concepts that Brooke has mentioned as well, 
uh, applied in the Moderna case. Um, so the, the first thing to realize, I guess, is that it is actually the NIH Moderna vaccine. And the NIH here is the National Institutes of Health. And so the story of Moderna uh, is, is a complicated story. There's lots of kind of twists and turns. I'm kind of, I'll, I'll walk you through most of it, but not all of it, because there's, there's too much to describe. Um, but it's really critical to understand just how deeply this small biotech Moderna was on the federal government. Um, so let's start from the beginning, right? So Moderna was founded you know, more than a decade ago. Um, and the name of the company comes from this idea of modifying RNA, modified RNA uh, that gets you Moderna, right? This crucial concept was in fact uh, pioneered by, again, NIH funded scientists at the University of Pennsylvania who were working and had figured out basically uh, a solution to a key problem, which was that when you inserted our RNA into the body, mRNA into the body, it was recognized as sort of, uh, uh, you know, the body would react to it too strongly. And as a result, it was not a good candidate for a, a, a therapeutic or vaccine. And so what uh, they ended up finding was that you could, if you were to modify the RNA, and I don't want to get too deep into the science, but if you were to modify the RNA, you know, it would, the body would be more willing to accept it, and then you could get it to do the, um, uh, uh, you could get it to translate into a protein, and you get the kind of positive beneficial medical effects you were looking at. Um, and so that was the key breakthrough, right? But that was a key breakthrough that happened at a university lab. Um, and then, of course, the company Moderna that was named after this uh, part, in part after this breakthrough, did its own work. And it was, you know, there was other uh, scientists uh, at Harvard, actually, where Moderna was spun out of, who also did some more work on uh, modifying RNA. But it really just goes to show the, the extent of which uh, we're talking about science as this kind of cumulative effort that uh, builds over time rather than um, you know, uh, one company sort of going alone and figuring it out. And so even after Moderna was launched, uh, this is like 2010s, right? Um, the company received its first infusion of funding from the federal government when it just had reported with three employees. That's what the head of an agency within the Department of Defense, DARPA says. Um, and the Department of Defense actually paid other roles too, uh, provided funding continually to Moderna. Um, it provided really early funding that uh, de-risked mRNA technology in a way, because at the time people thought that mRNA vaccines were kind of like science fiction, right? It was too, uh, it was too out there. And so you had the federal government who uh, stepped up. Um, and there was of course private investment too, but the part, the point here is that the federal government uh, understood its potential and was there. Uh, and so when the Zika virus hit again, the federal government then invested in another hundred million dollars. Um, and so, you know, for example, you know, there's a good article here about how DARPA, again, this is the Department of uh, Defense Agency, uh, DARPA's gambles might have created the best hopes for stopping COVID-19. And that was in part talking about uh, mRNA vaccine and, and COVID-19. And so we take this, you know, we start a story from this company that has benefited from federal fu funding in, in its uh, beginnings. Um, and then you fast forward a few years and you come to, uh, I think 2016 is when the National Institutes of Health, and so here, you know, think of Tony Fauci, Tony Fauci's team uh, started working with Moderna because they realized, look, this technology that they have, uh, we could use it to develop uh, uh, vaccines against infectious diseases. And so started doing some work together jointly on uh, developing new kinds of vaccines. And so this collaboration was going on um, when uh, the new coronavirus hit, right? And so then they quickly switched gears and they started uh, focusing on the new coronavirus and they uh, worked together. And this is the key part. They worked together to uh, jointly invent the, 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 the vaccine. And so the way to think about Moderna's technology is that it's sort of like, this is kind of a retro reference, uh, but it's like a cassette tape uh, and a cassette player. Right? So the platform is the cassette player, uh, and then the cassette tape is the sort of sequence you put in. And then, you know, once you put them to those two things together, you get the vaccine, you get the you know, audio being produced from the cassette player. Um, and so Moderna had been working on the cassette uh, 
player for a while, again, with federal, some federal investments uh, dating back many years. And then the new coronavirus hit, so they realized they have to come up with a new tape player. And that's where the NIH was really instrumental uh, in designing that uh, sequence. Um, and this company then, uh, with the NIH help, and then of course, so now, now you have the vaccine, but then you had to take it through the different stages of clinical trials. You had to um, uh, build out manufacturing capacity. And again, Moderna got huge um, federal subsidies uh, to facilitate this. Um, and so this is one of the contracts. This is not, you know, this is just one of, of uh, the contracts that uh, a U.S. government agency awarded to Moderna. And so you're looking at, you know, in total about $1.4 billion given to this company uh, for clinical trial work, for expanding manufacturing capacity, um, and to basically de-risk the development of the technology, um, you know, in large, large, large part. And so despite this, um, despite this federal contribution, despite this public sector contribution, um, there was um, there is a fundamental oversight, uh, I guess, right at the beginning um, in how much authority and control and oversight the federal government exercised. Um, and so you can see this in the way that the story has developed, right? And so you have this um, vaccine that was subsidized by taxpayers, uh, you know, uh, uh, jointly invented by federal scientists, uh, but then you and then, and then the vaccine gets authorized, right? And it's kind of like a amazing scientific moment. Um, and then immediately after you start to see these kind of issues creep up um, about uh, you know, what happens when a one company is allowed basically to, to control exclusively this, this um, important medical technology. So let me start first by, um, I guess pointing to this, right? Which is, this was a, a, a New York Times article that came out in October, um, which was you know, just really detailed uh, what was going on with the Moderna vaccine at that time. Um, and so you had this company uh, largely at the time uh, selling its vaccine to high <coughs> countries like Brooke mentioned. Um, and even the vaccines that it was selling to middle-income countries, it was selling to the middle-income countries for really exorbitant prices. We're talking, you know, I think Botswana ended up paying nearly $29 per dose uh, for the vaccine. And the vaccine was actually ended up being late. <laughs> and so, um, you know, 29 times two is a lot of money for a sub-Saharan African country to pay for a vaccine. And so this of course was um, not, what uh, was needed to respond to the pandemic, right? We needed the, the vaccine to be a, a public good. We needed the vaccine to be available to everyone who needs it around the world as quickly as possible. And so you saw, you know, stories like this where the Biden administration started expressing some concern about what is going on. <laughs> you know, why why are these vaccines not making it to low and middle income countries at appropriate prices? Um, Will Moderna help kind of expand production, share the technology, allow others to make the vaccine? Um, and so there was this frustration growing. Um, and it wasn't just frustration about the outputs. It turns out, you know, some of the work we had done kind of tracing some of the, the foundational patents. So think back to the cassette player and the, the cassette, right? The tape, the tape itself. And so we found in some patent filings that the NIH, who had helped uh, co-invent the vaccine, had asked to be named uh, on a key patent application that would cover uh, the cassette tape. Um, and Moderna said no. <laughs> Basically said no. Uh, you know, we don't think you did what you think you did, um, is what they seem to imply. Um, and so this was obviously, uh, you know, a huge source of concern. Um, so we wrote the NIH about it. And we you know, there was a story in the New York Times um, about it a, a couple of days later. And it shows, I think, really the fundamental questions here, right? About how this technology that was developed um, with such significant public support is then um, deployed 
in ways that are inconsistent with the public interest um, and are also, and, and, and not only is it deployed in ways that are in, in, uh, inconsistent with the public interest, it also seems to, um, uh, what's the right word? It also seems to um, minimize the contributions uh, of, of the public sector itself. Um, and so it turns out that NIH and Moderna are in dispute about who made the vaccine. Um, and it really, I think, points to this entire sort of saga that I have laid out. It really points to um, the inadequacies of the, of, the, of the status quo. You know, this was sort of like a, a business as usual approach um, and a different kind of world was possible, right? And, and we and, you know, Brooke and I and many others have been advocating from the beginning of the pandemic for this different approach. Um, and so what would that look like? You know, what was that necessarily? So I think one part of the, the story, an important part of the story is the idea that the knowledge that was funded by taxpayers uh, should not be a secret, right? Uh, particularly if that knowledge can help end the pandemic. <laughs> like, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a basic thought, but it's unfortunately something that we have seen over and over again. And so as a result of that, uh, that mistake, you get situations like this, which, which Brooke alluded to, which is, uh, you know, manufacturers in South Africa are trying to make uh, the Moderna vaccine, the NIH Moderna vaccine. Um, and Moderna has information that it is keeping secret uh, that could help this hub move faster. And the hub is making some progress, you know, it's trudging along, but it's still at a, at a lab scale. It needs to go, you know, it's producing things at a micro leader level. It needs to produce things at a, at a leader level. And so that's, that's quite a jump and it needs to make that jump, but it'll be much harder for it to do so without assistance from, from a company like Moderna, for example. Um, and so you have the situation where the company is now, you know, spending months and potentially years trying to figure out the information that Moderna already has. And this is also part of the story of, um, you know, what we uh, had been advocating for, I would say, since um, this is, this is, you know, I think we did this report in May of, of last year now, but, you know, we had been calling for something similar even before then. But the idea that, you know, we could foresee that there would be situations like the South Africa hub, right? That there would be others who would want to make the vaccine who would, not, who would, would, would benefit from Moderna's assist, assistance. And so we had been calling um, since, since early last year for the federal government to really make uh, a, a $25 billion investment to help produce 8 billion doses of mRNA vaccine. And so we worked with engineers that were then based at Imperial College to kind of model it out, to figure out exactly what, it would, be, what would be needed to produce so much vaccine in such a short time, uh, you know, we estimated the production lines. We, uh, you know, uh, figured out the operational costs, the capital costs, the advantages of mRNA. We went through the production process. Uh, you know, we we use some software that industry uses to estimate uh, exactly what the uh, mechanics of the process would be like. Um, and so, I think the point that I'm trying to make by by showing this is that it really was not a technical problem, right? The idea that we had these amazing vaccines and we needed to produce a lot of them, it was a, a political problem. Um, and it, it was the politics of, do we require these corporations that have benefited so much from public funding to share their technology with others um, in part? And so, then you get to the question of, okay, well, you know, you, you have a situation like Moderna. We acknowledge that the US government did some stuff, um, you know, in terms of providing scientific assistance, in terms of providing funding, but what could they have done, right? Like, what could they have actually done? And so one of the things they could have done is actually contractually write better contracts, right? You could have written uh, a better contract with Moderna so you could condition uh, the funding on meeting some public interest requirements, whether it's pricing requirements, whether it's about uh, providing immediate supply to low and middle income countries, or whether it's fundamentally about sharing the technology uh, and 
facilitating technology transfer to manufacturers in low and middle income countries. Um, you know, we, we did review the contract. We, we, we thought there were um, some uh, contractual provisions that could be used uh, to facilitate some of this. Um, and so, you know, again, we wrote this big report detailing how the US government might have some specific, uh, specific rights in the Moderna vaccine. And one kind of caveat here is that, of course, when you're dealing with these contracts, they're almost entirely redacted, right? So there's huge, huge uncertainty about exactly what's going on. And so we pushed the Biden administration to kind of clarify, you know, what, what data qualifies as unlimited rights data that you might have under the contract um, and to use other authorities to share this information, to share the vaccine recipe. Biden administration came back and said, we don't have unlimited rights to Moderna vaccine recipe. They did not provide the actual unredacted contract, which you still you know, want to look at, um, because clearly some of those provisions that were there for a reason and they covered something. Um, there were other authorities as well that we, we, we highlighted. So one of them was the Defense Production Act. The Defense Production Act gets thrown around a lot in popular discourse, but um, it is a very powerful law. It's an extraordinarily powerful law. Um, and it was sort of designed for these situations in mind, right? This is a national emergency. Nearly a million Americans have died. Um, and even President Biden has recognized the, the kind of the reality here, right? Which is that we know America will never be fully safe until the pandemic that is raging globally is under control. No ocean is wide enough, no wall is high enough to keep us safe. And so we suggested and we advocated for the Biden administration to use the Defense Production Act to scale vaccine production globally. Um, to require these corporations to share technology in exchange for reasonable compensation, uh, to share the vaccine recipe so we can um, have the best vaccines available for everyone and we have the infrastructure to respond quickly to new threats. Um, and so I want to point out some of the kind of legal authorities. So the Defense Production Act, basically there's, there's two main mechanisms for the Defense Production Act that can be applied here. One is the uh, what's called the, the uh, allocation authority, which allows the federal government to basically allocate uh, uh, materials and resources needed for you know, an emergency effort um, to protect the national defense. And the definition of materials includes technical information. Right? So it, it, it explicitly includes technical information, which is the kind of information that we uh, were asking the Biden administration to share with the rest of the world. The second part of the act was um, the priorities authorities. The priorities authority is the one that's more commonly used, which is the idea that the federal government can require a, US, uh, a corporation to prioritize and accept uh, a contract. And so you could imagine the federal government requiring Moderna to accept a contract to share technology, to uh, build manufacturing capacity, to uh, work with others around the world to, to, to help ramp up production. Um, and so members of Congress made similar demands, um, urging, you know, here's, for example, Senator Warren and Representative Schakowsky, urging the Biden administration to use the Defense Production Act, uh, expand glo uh, global vaccine access, use public manufacturing to expand global vaccine access. Um, and so that kind of brings us to the status quo where, you know, the pandemic is uncertain. Um, we People are optimistic and we hope that optimism, optimism is kind of well-found, um, but it's still, um, one, it's still raging in many parts of the world who remain. It's one thing to say the, you know, the pandemic is behind us when you're 60 to 70% vaccinated. It's an entirely different thing to say the pandemic is behind us when you know, your population is like 10 to 20% vaccinated. <laughs> and, those are two, and that is a reality in, still in, in, in large parts of the world. Um, so, Obviously, um, the, the kind of status quo has, has, has not worked, right? And I, I'll conclude by, I guess, saying two things. One, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I know a couple of weeks ago is, is a long time in kind of international relations, but a couple of weeks ago, the UN Secretary General uh, was speaking at a WHO event, and he said that vaccine inequity is the worst moral failure of our time. You know, that's, that's a... That's a that's a powerful statement uh, coming from the UN Secretary General. Um, 
And I think it, it's a it's a reminder of just how much has been lost and what is at stake still um, moving forward. Um, and to end, I guess, on a more positive note, which is that things, um, you know, there are developments, <laughs> I would say. Um, there are developments and there, there are some positive developments happening. And so for example, just yesterday actually, uh, the US announced uh, an intention to share some technology with the World Health Organization. We don't know which technology uh, it seems to be technology that the U.S. government, uh, you know, they haven't announced which technology. So it's, it, it seems to be technology that the NIH itself owns, uh, according to this article, that, the, you know, the details are still being ironed out. It's not going to apply to the vaccines and therapeutics that are already in private, you know, already in the market. So uh, not the Moderna vaccine, but then we've seen some kind of um, uh, I would say back and forth on that and then some mixed reporting on that. Um, but it, it, it certainly signals, you know, a, 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 a positive step forward, um, whether, you know, it, it, it kind of captures uh, the, the full needs of the moment will be remain to be seen, but it's, it, it's, um, it's something. So I'll stop there. I'm kind of happy to answer questions. All right, thank you so much um, for your contributions. Um, we're lucky enough to have until um, 1.15, so we have plenty of time to answer any questions that any of our um, attendees might have. Um, first, we have a comment for, 